Good morning. My name is Ashish Patel. I'm the Division Chief for Pediatric Gastroenterology. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds, Surgical Grand Rounds this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shahan Fernando this morning. Dr. Fernando has been here at Phoenix Children's since 2015 and is a valued member of our Pediatric Gastroenterology Division, um, as well as a valued member of the organization, currently serving as the Chair of Medicine um, for our hospital. Dr. Fernando completed his pediatric GI fellowship at University of Colorado prior to starting here at Phoenix Children's. He has been recognized for his outstanding clinical and educational contributions. He was Physician of the Year nominee, Attending of the Month nominee, as well as being involved in the Physician Children's Leadership Academy. This year, he was named as one of our final finalist recipients of the Phoenix Children's Patient and Family Experience Award. Clinically, Dr. Fernando has focused on therapeutic endoscopy. I'm proud to say that we have one of the largest therapeutic endoscopy programs in the country with three therapeutic endoscopists. The three faculty members include Dr. Mark McCumber, the leader of the program, Dr. Shahan Fernando, and Dr. Josh Carroll. They provide 365 day specialized coverage for therapeutic endoscopy at our institution. Today, Dr. Fernando will be delivering surgical grand rounds on pediatric therapeutic endoscopy or pediatric advanced endoscopy, not your average video game. Sean? Morning, morning. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that high introduction. And uh, even though she's not here today, Dr. Van Leeuwen, uh, thank her for the invitation for our program to come and talk about what we do. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So I have no disclosures. Uh, some objectives for the end of this talk is to understand some of the advantages uh, that we have to offer with advanced endoscopic procedures um, and, and kind of know the available resources here at our institution for patients that may need these procedures. And then review the basic workup of biliary obstruction. So endoscopy is a big part of what we do. Um, in fact, for many of us, it's also a big reason why we went into this practice. Um, and it all started about 150 years ago uh, when Dr. Kuzmal uh, woke up one morning, decided that he wanted to look inside someone's stomach. Uh, he walked outside the house, found a metal tube leaning against his house, picked it up, walked to the corner of the street, found the source wall we performing and said, why not? And there we go, the birth of endoscopy. Over the next 90 years, though, we've had a, a quite rapid evolution of our uh, gastroscopes where Dr. Hershowitz in 1957 invented the very first fiber optic gastroscope, really starting the evolution of our modern scopes that we know and use today. And this is supposedly an actual image photograph of him performing a, a, an awake endoscopic procedure on a patient that is very, very excited. <laughs> So fast forward several more decades, and here we have our more modern endoscope. So it looks a little bit different. It feels different. Comes in various lengths and diameters and, and different uh, um, inner parts and technology, but it really serves the same main purpose in our practice. And that is to obtain images of the intestinal tract. And then also important is to obtain biopsies of the mucosal lining. And with these two pieces of information, these are the cornerstone of what we do in GI and really helps to um, advance our diagnostic um, evaluation of patients in clinic or in the hospital. The two main types of diagnostic procedures that we do in our practice is an esophageal gastroduinoscopy, also known as an EGD, and a colonoscopy. A survey that was done back in 2019 um, uh, looked at all GI practices in the North America, so Canada, U.S., and Mexico, and they surveyed who and, and how many practices actually perform these procedures. And not surprisingly, majority of practices do. About 95% perform EGDs and 93% perform colonoscopies. But what about advanced endoscopy? What is that? In the most general sense, it is anything beyond a normal diagnostic evaluation. That could be anything from removing a polyp to removing a foreign body 
um, placing a stent. And the same survey also looked at practices and asked how many people are doing advanced endoscopic procedures. And they found that they do a lot. And this is a, 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 just a, a sample of the number of different advanced procedures that we have to offer. Uh, starting off on the left, which is a polypectomy, all the way to the right is endoluminal stent placement and everything in between. And because of our, our practice and the in incredible expertise that we have here at Phoenix Children's, we actually perform a majority of these advanced procedures here. And even a couple of them which aren't labeled, we can actually still do. So argon plasma coagulopathy uh, is a special hemostatic technique. Uh, if we need it, it's rarely used, but if we need it, we can always bring down the equipment and perform the procedure. And then soon in the near future, we'll be able to do uh, single balloon endoscopy or deep small bowel endoscopy once the equipment is back on the market. So we have a lot to offer here at Phoenix Children's. But what about endoscopic retrograde clangia pancreatography or ERCP? What makes it different? Well, first of all, our target is different. Instead of just the main lumen of the GI tract, we're, we're talking about structures that are adjacent to the GI tract. In particular, we hang out in the second portion of the duodenum here, and our main target is the major papilla, which is on the medial side of the duodenum. And that serves as the main primary exit of the biliary tree, which is highlighted in green, as well as the pancreatic duct here. The structures are quite small. The ampulla is perhaps maybe two, three millimeters at the most um, in opening. So in order to access these very specific structures, specific angles, you have to use a specialized scope. So this is what we call a side viewing duodenoscope. It's different in many ways, including you know diameter, but the two primary differences compared to our standard forward viewing scope is that the camera is actually on the side of the camera. This allows us to have more of an on plus view of the ampulla as we go down in the duodenum. It also has a, has a special elevator tool that helps to lift our catheters or our instruments and tools into the prop, you know, appropriate angle in order to cannulate and get access. So not only do you have special targets, special equipment, but this also requires special training as well. And it's not something that we readily get in fellowship Unfortunately, often our advanced endoscopists require uh, acquire our training out in the field. So we have hands-on training and it's sort of a right place at the right time, having a mentor that can teach you and show you the, the proper techniques. There is one fourth year fellowship, a pediatric fellowship that is in San Antonio. They only take one fellow per year, but with the growing, rapidly growing need for advanced endoscopists, I really predict that in the next five to 10 years, we'll start to see more fourth year advanced pediatric fellowships popping up. And who knows, maybe here at Phoenix Children's as well. A study that was done actually by our very own Dr. Paul Tran while he was in fellowship, uh, performed a survey of all the endoscopists, advanced endoscopists in the country. And as of about two years ago, there's only 27 of us in the country across 12 states and 22 institutions. You can see sort of the distribution on the map there. And Phoenix Children's is still the only facility that has three advanced endoscopists here. And who are we? So as Dr. Patel mentioned, Dr. McComber is the leader of the group. He joined the practice in 2008. Uh, prior to his arrival, we had two adult gastroenterologists that would come in and do our cases. And that's really more of a common scenario in most of our pediatric facilities that don't have endoscopists who can perform these. I joined in 2015, and then Dr. Carroll joined in 2017 from Dallas. Our program is growing, um, and we do more than just ERCPs, but the focus of the talk will be on that. But over the years, we are doing more and more cases. So when I joined in 2015, on the left, we we're doing about 45 ERCPs per year. Over the last two years, though, our numbers have jumped to over the, uh, more than 80 cases per year. And as of January of 2024, we're off to a pretty strong start. And this mostly involves biliary duct procedures versus pancreatic duct, but we do a good portion of both. So there are multiple indications for ERCP, um, and we'll go through all of them today. 
So the number one indication for ERCP is cholecystitis, or a stone that's uh, inside the duct and causing obstruction. Another indication is a cholecystitical cyst, which is a cystic dilatation of the biliary tree. And then a bowel duct stricture, and this could be inflammatory or from a, a number of other causes. And these three entities comprise of extrahepatic cholecysts, and we'll talk about that evaluation. We also see biliary traumas, and this could be secondary to a, a blunt abdominal trauma or secondary to a surgical procedure. And flipping to the other side, we also do ERCPs for pancreatitis as well as pancreatic trauma, and we have cases for all of these today. So as you know, nothing in medicine is risk-free and ERCP has its own complications. And the one complication that we always talk about with families for, for certain, and we always worry about is called PEP or post-ERCP pancreatitis. In the adult world, the rate of pancreatitis is approximately five to 10%. And when pediatric advanced endoscopists began doing these procedures many years ago, that was one of the main concerns. Can we do it? Are we safe enough? And thankfully, a large multi-center consortium of advanced endoscopists published data on our success and complication rates and found that our rate is about 5%. So we're just as safe as our adult colleagues. We also have other uh, complications which are um, very, very minimal, including bleeding and perforation. And one that is more unique to the pediatric population is technical success. So we've definitely learned that the younger the patient, especially though those younger than age two or three years of age, and smaller patients, ones that are less than 10 kilos, are just more difficult. In fact, we actually have a special scope for these patients too, which is a pediatric side viewing Dudina scope, which is we're very lucky to have one. I think we're only one of three or four institutions that actually have a working scope available since it's been discontinued. So let's talk about a patient with extra hepatic cholestasis. Now, now the, the difference with cholestasis is quite broad. We'll focus on just extra hepatic causes. And the main question that we get asked is, does my patient need an ERCP? So it all become, uh, starts with signs and symptoms of abdominal pain, usually in the right upper quadrant, sometimes in the epigastrium, um, scleral icterus and jaundice. Usually the biliary needs to be a little more elevated to see those uh, signs, of course, nausea and vomiting. Common labs that we ask for and obtain include total and direct bilirubin. The direct bilirubin is a pretty sensitive marker for biliary obstruction, but it's not very, uh, sorry, it's more specific, but not very sensitive. The GGT, on the other hand, is more sensitive, but not as specific. We also have other liver function tests, including alkaline phosphatase, ALT, AST. We like to often get a lipase level to look for pancreatitis. And sometimes we're lucky we get a urine bilirubin uh, that can be elevated in patients that have a biliary obstruction. Imaging includes ultrasound, a uh, most commonly um, ordered study, MRCP, and then CT, which are usually done at the outside facilities prior to arrival here. The differential diagnosis of extrahepatic cholestasis is quite broad. And as I mentioned before, cholecystitis is the number one indication and etiology. Other ones include cholecystitis, strictures, including primary sclerosis and cholangitis, pancreatitis. Rarely, thankfully, in children, we see malignancies. And then the infamous parasite that my partner, Tom Conver, is still waiting to see uh, before he retires. <laughs> So cholecystitis is, again, a primary indication, and a lot of research has gone into trying to determine who is likely to have it. Despite our imaging and our lab studies, it's not always clear if a person has it or has a risk for it and then needs an ERCP. So this is an adult guideline that was published many years ago and revised more recently, looking at different predictors of cholecystitis. And then based on that, they assign a, a risk stratification on the patient. So the very strong indicators are the more obvious one, which is you actually see a stone in the duct on ultrasound, which is not very common. Clinical ascending cholangitis. These patients, remember, they usually come in with abdominal pain and jaundice. So once you start adding in fevers, then you kind of complete that triad. A total bilirubin greater than four, and emphasize total bilirubin. 
Strong indicators, uh, predictors include dilated common bowel duct. And even though we say four millimeters is quite average for our patients, we will push it up to six millimeters as normal in our older and bigger patients. And a total bilirubin between 1.8 and 4. Some moderate predictors, other abnormal liver tests, including GGT, ALT, AST, and then clinical gallstone pancreatitis, another reason why we like to get a light based level. Based on that, we can categorize patients into low, intermediate, and high risk. Low risk is easy. They have no predictors. They go straight to a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. High risk is also fairly straightforward. They either have one of the very strong um, so we have option of either doing an MRCP to better visualize the bowel duct. However, MRCP is not perfect. It does have issues with, with resolution, especially with finding very small stones. And it's also flow dependent. The other option is that the patient goes to surgery. They can perform an intraoperative cholangiogram, an IOC, and try and visualize if there's an obstructing stone. And from there, they often try and flush out the stone if possible while they're there. Otherwise, we will then perform a post-operative ERCP. The direct bilirubin. If you ever call us for a consult, one of the first questions we ask is, what is a direct bilirubin? If you don't have one, we ask for one. So it doesn't make sense why total bilirubin is the main focus in the guidelines. It makes more sense that direct bilirubin should be there. And thankfully, the same Pediatric Advanced Consortium researched this and, and found that, well, yes, it does matter. And it is actually helpful. So conjugated bilirubin or direct bilirubin does play a role. And the higher the level, not surprising, you get increased specificity, increased positive predictive value, and increased odds ratio of there being a stone. In particular, a direct bilirubin greater than two gives you the highest uh, predictor of having cholecystitis. But again, despite all these labs and our advanced imaging studies, there are times where we swing and we miss meaning that we take the patient back, we do an ERCP, and we don't find a stone. So we then go from a therapeutic ERCP to a diagnostic ERCP, and we have some beautiful pictures, but that's pretty much it. And unfortunately, we still subject the patient to anesthesia, as well as all the same risk of an ERCP, including post-ERCP pancreatitis. And unfortunately, this happens a little too common. It happens about 20 to 30% of the time. And this is true in the adult world and the pediatric world. And just looking at our data from last year, we're right around 30% as well. So this doesn't sit well with us. We're hoping to uh, investigate this further and come up with some new indicators and predictors specific to the pediatric world. But let's not talk about misses. Let's talk about some home runs and we'll go over some, some cases. So this is a preoperative ERCP case of a 12-year-old male with right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Here are the labs. So drug bilirubin is not terribly elevated at 0 0.9, total is 2.2. Elevated liver function tests, elevated GGT, and a normal light pace. So the patient is actually coming from the outside facility where they perform the CT scan. And just for reference, so anything that's fluid filled is gonna be dark. So this is a very distended fluid filled stomach. Got the bladder down here, the gallbladder right here, and then Right above that, you have a fluid-filled tubular structure, which is a dilated bowel duct. And this is approximately 10 millimeters on imaging. Our primary imaging modality is gonna be an ultrasound, which is performed on the floor or in the ER. And in this ultrasound, the patient had evidence of gallstones, as well as a dilated common bowel duct, which you see on the left, uh, measuring at around 10 millimeters or so. In fact, a dilation extends into the intrahepatic ducts as well. On the right, you see an intrahepatic, uh, left intrahepatic duct with a dilated duct of around 3.6 millimeters. Normally, these should be more like around two, one or two. So based on, based on labs and imaging findings, uh, we would categorize this patient as a high risk for having a dilated bowel duct as well as an elevated uh, total bilirubin. So he meets criteria and we take him to an ERCP.
So the upper image on the left there is our typical view of the ampulla using our side beaming 2D scope. Uh, and, and we have a positive bile sign here as bile is coming out of that orifice. And then on the bottom left, you see our main kind of workhorse instrument that we use in the ERCP, which is called a sphincter tone. This serves uh, a couple of different functions, including trying to access and cannulate the bile duct, um, which again, if you remember, that shares a common exit for both the pancreatic and the biliary side. So we have to selectively cannulate up to choice. Uh, inside, there's a, a 0 0.025 inch guide wire that we use to help get into the right position. And that wire that you see here on top uh, has two purposes. One, it helps to bow or bend the catheter in the position that we want. It also helps us do our sphincterotomy or cut the, the sphincter muscle open. We usually start with a little bit of contrast injection and you'll see the wire here that's up into, looks like it's going into the left uh, hepatic duct. We start injecting contrast. And right there in the distal end of the common bell duct, we see a filling defect, most likely a stone. And routinely, when we do any ERCP, we like to evaluate the entire biliary tree. So we often do a obstructive cholangiogram, looking at the proximal bell ducts. And here you can see it is quite dilated. You know, uh, our scope is about 13 millimeters. So this is um, at least that, maybe 15 millimeters in diameter. The next step is to actually perform a sphincterotomy. So we open the exit, otherwise we won't be able to get our instruments or a stone out. You see our guide wire there too, holding us in the proper position. And then as we're dragging the duct with a special extraction balloon, you start to see the emergence of something dark coming out. And there we go, we popped out a black stone. And normally our stones are yellow uh, or more typical cholesterol stones, but this one is black. And whenever we see that we do consider hemolysis as part of the underlying source of these stones. Um, however, this patient actually had a full workup. We, we asked our, our hospitalist colleagues to do an initial workup. It was actually seen in outpatient hematology clinic and everything actually was negative. This patient went on to a successful lap coli the very next day and went home with a normal bilirubin and down training liver function test. Did really well. Next common procedure we do is a post-operative ERCP. So this is a 13-year-old female with rapid abdominal pain, nausea. Labs aren't too impressive. Total bilia is only 1.5 with a direct bilia of 0.7. LFTs are elevated at 358 and 174, and light pace is normal. Her initial ultrasound showed gallstones, uh, but also a common bowel duct of about 7.3 millimeters. Then the very next day, her pain could clearly resolve, nausea resolve, and this was not because of medications. And in fact, her labs started to also improve as well. You see everything is down trending in the right direction. We even repeat the ultrasound and it's about the same, around 8.4 millimeters, not a significant difference. So based on this, we risk stratify her more kind of in the intermediate risk since the bilirubin wasn't very elevated, but the duct was, and she had some LTs that were abnormal. So we actually declined to do an ERCP in this patient and continue to follow her and watch her. A couple of days later, she still remained clinically asymptomatic and her labs continued to decrease. We're like, okay, well maybe she passed a stone, which is not uncommon. At this point, she was recommended to proceed with the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which she did. And fortunately, our surgical colleague performed an intraoperative clangiogram, and you can see them uh, injecting contrast, and you can see the biliary tree lighting up on fluoroscopic imaging, mildly dilated left and right, um, and then a very dilated common bile duct, pretty consistent with our ultrasound findings. And right at the very, very end, you see another filling defect at the bottom of the common bile duct. Now, at this point, um, the surgeon uh, gave some glucagon trying to stimulate, um, and they also did some, some high pressure flushes trying to get the stone out, but they were unsuccessful. So the patient went on to still be asymptomatic, but then the labs are to uh, drastically change and go up in the wrong direction. At so this point, we took her back to uh, a post-operative ERCP. 
Now, this is this is her view of the ampulla, so very different from the previous one. So this one is a, has a very bulbous looking appearance to the ampulla, and sometimes this may indicate an obstructive stone right there above the ampulla. And even the ampulla itself, the orifice, is usually circular, uh, but in this case, it has more of a slit-like appearance, so which may indicate that she's passed stones before, smaller stones before. So again, we pass the wire. This one's now going into the right hepatic duct and we start injecting contrast. We see the dilated common bowel duct and then we still see the same feeling defect in the distal common bowel duct. As we perform the rest of our evaluation, doing an obstructive clangiogram, you can, again, once you can see the dilated left and right hepatic ducts. And then as we're injecting contrast, you can see the filling defect has moved. So it's kind of bouncing up and down the common bowel duct. And this is not an uncommon thing. Uh, and we refer to it as a ball valve effect. So when the stone pops up, more proximally, bile flows through, decompresses, the labs get better, patient feels better. And then when the, when the stone gets back down and, and obstructs the, the end, we get labs abnormal again. So this is probably what happened during the IOC as they're trying to flush the stone out. They lodge the stone more distally and the labs got worse the very next day. We performed a sphincterotomy we and we pulled out a single yellow stone. This is what we typically see, the yellow cholesterol stone. A uh, patient did well, discharged the very next day, normal, uh, normal bilirubin levels and downtrending LFTs. No issues, haven't seen her since. So moving on to another uh, common cause of extrahepatic cholestasis is a cortical cyst. So this is a three-year-old female uh, <clears throat> presents with abdominal pain, jaundice, and pale colored stools. Her numbers are quite moderate, bilirubin of 4.1, direct of 3.2, elevated liver enzymes, elevated GGT, and a mildly elevated lipase as well. Her ultrasound is actually quite interesting. She has no gallstones, but she has a massively dilated common bowel duct that's measuring at 18 millimeters in diameter. So when we see a patient of this age, normal body habitus, no other risk factors, a very dilated duct, but no gallstones, we think about cortical cysts or differential. So cortical cysts, there are multiple different types. So here, in the upper right is our most common type. It's called type one, and this is a fusiform dilation of the extrahepatic bowel duct. Moving on to type two, this is a little codocal seal. Type three is a uh, cystic dilation of the ampulla, also known as a codocal seal. Um, and then a type four, which is the second most common between 20 and 30% of the time. Type four A are multiple cystic structures, both involving the intrahepatic and the extrahepatic bile duct. Type 4B are multiple cystic structures only involving the extrahepatic bile duct. Type 5 are multiple cysts only in the intrahepatic, also known as Caroli. And then a very rare type 6, which I just saw last year for the first time, which is cystic dilation of the cystic duct. And these are not very common. You can see the incidence there, more common in females. They're either congenital or acquired, and they're multifactorial. But the most common cause is, um, of a cortical cyst is what we call an APBJ, or an aberrant pancreatic biliary junction. So instead of the pancreas, the pancreatic duct, joining the ampulla at the very end, right by the ampulla, um, the, the pancreatic duct actually joins uh, a little bit higher up in the bowel duct. And I'll show you a picture just a little bit. We care about these cortical cysts really not, not a whole lot during the pediatric time period, although it can be a nidus of infection or obstruction. Uh, but later in life, there's a real risk of malignancy, in particular cholangiocarcinoma. It's not a good one to have. And the risk is highest in our type 1 and type 4 cortical cysts. The incidence is really, really low in our pediatric population in the first two decades of life. But we want to inter intervene during that time frame so that we can prevent or reduce the risk later on, which can be overall about 11%, but the, but the risk increases with every decade of life uh, starting in their 20s, up to about 40% in their 60s. So this patient, you can see obstructive clangiogram, a very massively dilated, uh, I believe we're now in the common hepatic duct right here. So uh, 
a lot of dilation in both the left and the right. In this cholangiogram here, you can see areas that are actually more normal. So there, it appears to be multiple different cysts involved. And as we're dragging the contrast, the, the catheter down, injecting contrast, you see a little outpouch of contrast going up along the side of the cystic structure. And this is actually the pancreatic duct. So instead of the pancreatic duct joining the common bowel duct at the level of the ampulla, it's actually about two centimeters proximal. So this is your aberrant pancreatic ability junction, which is the number one cause of the clinical cyst. We perform a sphincterotomy, and as we do that, we start to see some sludge and debris come out. And we drag that, that dilated duct, and we actually get this four centimeter long cast of biliary sludge and debris. It's almost in the shape of the actual cystic structure itself. Quite satisfying, actually. But <laughs> And then a few weeks later, we obtain an MRCP. So one of the main things we can do therapeutically is to perform a sphincterotomy to help decompress. And you can see the MRCP relatively shows some mild decompression, especially up in the common hepatic duct. Um, but here you can clearly see the multiple different cystic structures here, some more normal areas in between. And once again, we see the aberrant pancreatic mobility junction here with the PD taking off. So we refer this patient over to surgery, and then six weeks later, she had her uh, type 4A cortical cyst resected, and this large tubular structure which is being held up is actually the common hepatic duct. Um, at the same time as the cyst resection, she had her gallbladder removed and a hepatic duodenostomy performed. And she did really well, and so far... So good. We do monitor, monitor these patients in clinic about once a year or so with repeat imaging and some biomarkers uh, surveying for malignancy. Next, we'll talk about the stricture. So this is a patient, uh, 16 years old, with a known history of primary sclerosis and cholangitis and autoimmune hepatitis, presents with worsening jaundice, scleral uterus, despite not having any abdominal pain, nausea, or signs of cholangitis. So the bilirumas are quite impressive. Total bilirum of 1.2, direct of 8, mildly elevated LFTs, and an elevated GGT. His ultrasound is actually quite stable for him. His common bowel duct measures around 8.4 millimeters, which based on previous imaging is, is about his usual diameter. But when we performed an MRCP, again, you can see areas of dilation and also very classic for primary sclerosis and cholangitis um, in, in the intrahepatic ducts, but very dilated branches. Um, and they can see this area of signal dropouts indicating a very high grade stricture. We performed the ERCP. We find a very similar picture with our cholangiogram where the, there's a high grade stricture with proximal dilation, specifically in the right hepatic duct. Possible stricture in the left duct as well. It's a little more difficult to see. So with one of his ERCPs, uh, the first task is trying to open up the area. So you can see this shadow of what looks like a kind of a tubular structure or a sausage. This is actually a balloon that is dilating the area that, uh, with the dominant stricture. Following the Violation, we go ahead and place a plastic biliary stent across that structure to help decompress. Also help the area to hopefully heal the scar in a larger diameter. And as soon as we place that stent, um, uh, a lot of bile started to pour out, both from around and then through the, the stent itself. Stents can stay in there forever. These biliary stents typically uh, we keep for about four to six weeks. So we go back in again for another ERCP. We shoot more contrast and maybe a little bit better with the dominant stricture. We go ahead and repeat the balloon dilation again. And because my wire went up into the left hepatic duct this time, I went ahead and dilated that little branch as well, right? Um, just proximal to the bifurcation. Then we had to make a decision. Do we put another stent in like before, which will then require me to come back a few weeks later and do this whole process again? Or do we take a chance and we leave them without a stent? And the goal for that method, that, that thought process, is to see, is he going to be stent dependent? And that makes a big deal when it comes to his underlying diagnosis and prognosis. If a patient is stent dependent, 
um, with this PSC, then that may be an indication for us to proceed with the transplant evaluation. Because we can only do this so many times. Surprisingly, this patient has actually been doing pretty well for the last 10 months. He's been asymptomatic, normal total bilirubin, direct bilirubin is very mildly elevated. Um, but unfortunately with PSE, which is a progressive disease, um, it's not really a matter of if, it's when he'll have another dominant stricture. So switching gears just a little bit, uh, biliary trauma. So this is a 17 year old female with history of morbid obesity. She's uh, about 300 pounds, presents with abdominal pain and vomiting. Labs aren't too bad. Total bilirubin 1.4, direct of 0 0.8, mildly elevated ALT, AST. There is an lipacemia, so evidence of pancreatitis. She came in from outside facility with a CT scan and uh, you can see that her common bowel duct is mildly dilated, approximately 10 millimeters or so. We performed ultrasound here, but the bowel duct on ultrasound is actually not that impressive. It's only 6.5 millimeters, which, you know, yes, it is above our goal of six, but given her, her age and size, body habitus, it's not terribly abnormal. And they didn't see any interluminal building defects or stones, but they did see a lot of gallstones and a lot of stones in the neck of the gallbladder and even within the cystic duct. Mm -hmm. In fact, they actually found a 16 millimeter stone within the cystic duct itself. Gotta love kids, they don't follow the rules. So her belly pain completely resolved the very next day. No more nausea, mm -hmm. no more vomiting. In fact, her labs started to get better as well, all of them. So we classified her as more kind of intermediate risk. Um, Maybe even low, depending on 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 how you how you classify her bowel duct being dilated. So plan for a cholecystectomy the following day, and even the next day, her labs continue to get better. However, this was not a simple laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It's actually quite difficult, given her body habitus. Um, we had to use increased traction forces to lift up the liver and and access the gallbladder fossa, and she had a lot of localized inflammation. In fact, this ended up. Uh, leading to an avulsion of the cystic duct. And the team was unable to locate um, and ligate the cystic duct stump. So at this point, they completed the laparoscopic cholecystectomy and placed a JP drain. Apparently, this is a little more common in the adult world. Um, and, and sometimes if we're lucky with conservative management with the JP drain, MPO status, um, the cystic duct can seal on its own. So that's what we tried to do with her. She actually did pretty well. We start, even started her on a clear liquid diet. She had no abdominal pain. Labs were all normalized. This was two or three days out, which is quite unusual. If you have biliary uh, peritonitis, um, it's painful. And usually after about 40 hours, your bilirubin levels start to increase um, with that. However, her JP output had a mildly bile tinge appearance. So at that point, a, a few days later, we took her back for an ERCP. So in this contrast image, you'll see contrast going up into the common bowel duct, up into the common hepatic duct. And here's the cystic duct going right here. And right here, you see kind of a little blush of contrast right where the JP drain is. And this is confirmed biliary leak at the cystic duct stump. At this point, we placed, uh, after performing spectrotomy, we placed a long biliary stent across this area to help decompress the proximal bowel ducts while trying to seal off and decrease flow through the cystic duct. In the interim, about three weeks after the initial ERCP, her JP drain was actually discontinued. She had no more output. We brought her back about four weeks later for her second ERCP, which you can see her stent here in place. I shot an obstructive clangiogram. I shot a lot of contrast, a lot of pressure to try and interrogate the cystic duct and there's no more leakage. Stent was pulled and she was all set to go. I'm going to switch gears completely and go to the pancreatic side, the dark side. So this is an 18-year-old male presents in clinic for chronic abdominal pain and poor weight gain. He came as actually a second opinion. He had a pretty extensive workup uh, done by his pediatrician as well as an outside gastroenterologist. The one thing they didn't check for some reason is a life pace. It was 826. This is outpatient labs. So we start off with an ultrasound. An ultrasound here 
uh, it's an image of the pancreatic head, um, and it shows a, a, a diffusely echogenic pancreas with numerous um, shadowing sort of uh, calcifications throughout the pancreas. So indicating some parenchymal disease and possibly a chronic picture. He went on to have a CT scan, and uh, which confirmed the numerous calcifications, which you can see right here. Also confirmed more of a acute on chronic picture. And he actually had multiple fluid filled uh, uh, collections around the pancreas consistent with uh, pancreatic pseudocyst. We then move on to an MRCP. And so in this image, you can see the duodenum filled, filled with contrast. You can see it light up right here. And you can see a very uh, a faint shadow of the bowel duct coursing down in this direction and entering the major ampulla right around here. However, if you follow the pancreatic duct, which is very dilated, very abnormal appearing, tortuous, um, it starts to take a little turn and go more proximate towards the, the minor propella. So this is uh, concerning for a pancreas divisa. Um, and even within this abnormal pancreatic duct, you see lots of uh, filling defects and shadowing stones. The chronic pancreatitis, just briefly, is a chronic inflammatory process. The main difference between this and acute pancreatitis is that there, there is irreversible damage to the pancreas, leading to pancreatic ductal abnormalities, which we see in this patient, as well as pancreatic exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Multiple etiologies, including genetic, obstructive, autoimmune, toxic, and idiopathic are favored. Unfortunately, this patient not only had an obstructive picture with the concern for a divism, but he's also found to have a spink one genetic mutation as well. So divism is basically a failure of the ventral duct and the dorsal duct diffuse during development. So normally you've got the pancreas draining across the main pancreatic duct, going down what we call the duct of Wurstung to the major propella. You also have a minor duct or accessory duct of Santorini that exits um, out the minor papilla. There are actually three subtypes of divism, this uh, in B being the most common type, where you have no connection between the dorsal and the ventral pancreatic ducts. It's the most common congenital anomaly, actually. In a series of autopsy um, studies, they found to be anywhere up to 10% of, of people have this, and most are asymptomatic. But in patients that have recurrent pancreatitis, it can be a cause in up to about 25% of those patients. And sort of the leading theory is that because the majority of the pancreas has to now drain through the minor papilla, which is a lot smaller, that this leads to int introductory hypertension, recurrent bouts of pancreatitis, leading to chronic changes. So this is an endoscopic view of the minor papilla. So it's very small, you can often miss it. It's hard to find sometimes. Um, so we inject contrast and do an obstructive pancreatogram. You can see a very dilated pancreatic duct going here, very tortuous all the way across, as well as multiple large filling defects. So uh, um, concerning for stones. So this patient undergoes multiple ERCPs in, in attempts to kind of remove this debris and stones, even has uh, pancreatic duct stents placed in order to try and break up the stones um, in between our procedures, some of the debris was removed, but a lot was still left behind. So we're kind of stuck at this point. Now we get some really cool stuff. So pancreatoscopy with EHL or uh, electrohydraulic lithotripsy. So this is a specialized tool that we have in ERCP, where it's a 3.6 millimeter cholangioscope. So it's actually a mini scope that has its own camera lighting system and a single little channel. And this actually goes through the duodenoscope and into the duct. And typically it's used in um, the bowel duct for like large biliary stones, but we can also use it in the pancreatic side as well. So here's an endoscopic view of us placing this clangioscope through the minor propella. And here's a fluoroscopic image of the, of the clangioscope that's well within the pancreatic duct right here. And then we switch cameras and now we actually see inside the pancreatic duct. So what you see in front of you are actually the pancreatic stones directly in front of us. The problem with pancreatic stones is that they're a lot harder than biliary stones, which is they're, they're more difficult to break apart and remove. So in order to deal with these really hard stones or like boulders, 
um, we use a special device called EHL or electron drive lithotripsy, which is actually a small catheter that goes through the cholangioscope and you bring it right to um, the stone and actually sends um, uh, high frequency shock waves and actually tries to fracture the stones into pieces. And once we do that, and it usually takes multiple sessions because these stones are very, very difficult and very hard, um, you can break them into small pieces. And from there, right here in this image, we use a wire basket to try and grab these stones and then we pull off the stones one by one. This patient actually has done really well since this procedure. Um, but again, with chronic pancreatitis being a chronic irreversible condition, um, we will be on the lookout and monitoring very closely for recurrence of his pancreatic stones. Pancreatic trauma, another interesting case. So this is a two-year-old uh, male, uh, came as level one trauma. Uh, little boy actually fell off a boat that was being docked um, at one of our local lakes. And he was run over either by the truck or the trailer, it's not entirely clear. His total bilirubin is actually normal, um, elevated LFTs and an elevated lipase level. So cross-sectional imaging um, performed by the trauma service indicates a high-grade uh, pancreatic laceration um, just to the left of the superior mesenteric vein, so more kind of between the neck and the body of the pancreas. And based on trauma guidelines uh, involving pancreatic injury, he was classified as a high-grade three pancreatic laceration. So this involves um, ductal injury as well. Now in any other facility, this patient actually meets criteria to go straight to a distal pancreatectomy. However, over the last 15 years, you've actually developed this, this great collaborative approach with our uh, trauma service where they will actually call us to perform an ERCP. And because we're available 24 seven, we go in whenever they ask us to. And try and interrogate um, the duct in terms of its integrity. So in this situation, the patient is actually small, so we actually had to use the pediatric eudinoscope. So it looks a little bit different. It's more challenging and it's not quite as um, has the same therapeutic options available. But we were able to actually inject contrast first into the biliary side, and you can see as we inject contrast, here's the common hepatic duct going up into the left hepatic duct, you'll see a little blush of contrast right here. This is actually consistent with um, the liver lacerations that the patient actually also has. Because the location of this, of this ductal leak um, is too far proximal, we can't really place stents using this, this pediatric duodenoscope. So a sphincterotomy was, was performed to help with drainage. We then focused our attention on the pancreatic side. And you can see us uh, filling contrast into the pancreatic duct going around into the body and tail of the pancreas. And this is where we were suspecting the pancreatic duct uh, injury, and the duct is actually quite normal. The patient has a parenchymal laceration, but the duct is completely intact. So this actually saved the patient from having a distal pancreatectomy. This actually happens more often than we thought. In fact, in 2015, Dr. McComber, Dr. Matrika, and Dr. Garvey actually did a, a case series looking at these these patients. Um, and more recently, they're actually working on a bigger study um, uh, looking at the use of endoscopic retrograde cluster pancreatography in our patients that have abdominal trauma and pancreatic injury. So this is a retrospective review of 28 patients with blunt abdominal trauma and concerns for a main pancreatic duct injury. Uh, 23 of these patients had abnormal imaging studies concerning for a ductal injury, and five had clinical concerns for ductal injury, but normal imaging. And surprisingly, in almost 40% of these cases, there was a discordance between imaging and ERCP findings. Seven of these 11 patients had sure. ductal injuries found on imaging, but they had completely normal ERCP like in our case here. So all seven patients did not require any surgical intervention. And four of these patients on the flip side had normal imaging, but then ERCP found um, a ductal injury in these patients. And two were high grade enough where they ended up needing surgery, which actually uh, uh, significantly improved their overall outcomes. So we're very excited to see the outcome of this paper. The abstract was actually recently accepted into the American Pediatric Surgical Association conference, which I think is in May this year. Um, so very excited to see more 
of this and also spread the word to our surgical and GI colleagues across the country. So in summary, we have a variety of advanced endoscopic procedures available here at Phoenix Children's. Um, and they each have their own unique, but also a multitude of therapeutic advantages. ERCP by itself is a unique advanced procedure for the biliary and pancreatic diseases. The initial evaluation for extrahepatic cholestasis begins with laboratory and imaging studies, specifically at direct bilirubin. And evaluation and management is really a team effort between the pediatrician, outpatient community, the ER, hospitalist, surgical team, and then GI. Thank you for your time. Questions? Yes. Um, in terms of the education um, and the training, was the whole simulation play specifically in this ERCP aspect of So unfortunately, I uh, so the question was, you know, is there a simulation option for this for this uh, procedure? Um, I'm not aware of of any simulation. The, the the basic foundation for this is to have good endoscopic skills, which is what our fellows are, are are learning right now. So there are simulations for that. So I think just learning the good good basic techniques is what helps you become a better advanced endoscopist. Are our fellows here getting any uh, of this? They get to see it when they're on service, absolutely. And I think at least one of them is interested in learning more about it. Okay. Will we ever offer a, a, fellowship, I mean, a therapeutic endoscopy fellowship here? I hope so someday. Okay. That's actually a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys, you guys, like I came here when uh, Mark got here and I came from a place where there was no pediatric and that's how we and it was a problem for the surgeons. We would do maneuvers that were maybe dangerous for the kids from the laparoscopic side when really you guys do such a nice job um, endoscopically and really save a ton. So you're the biggest group of um, therapeutic endoscopists in the country. You guys have a huge um, breadth of experience and yeah, depth of experience as well. What are the barriers to setting up the public? So what are the barriers to Sigma Fellowship? So one of the barriers, both in practice as well, is that we uh, are looking to try and bring endoscopic ultrasound yeah. here to our facility. Another huge advantage of advanced endoscopy. The training for that is a little more challenging, uh, more specific. But I think in order to have a, a comprehensive fellowship program, we need to have that here as well. So that's the first step, uh, which, which we're, we're working on. Um, so that means you have to be, somebody has to be in the trouble. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, uh, uh, most likely outside of the Phoenix area. Um, uh, and and there are facilities out there that will train. Um, but then once we have it here, then we can offer that to our, our colleagues. And, and um, I agree with you. I, I think based on the breadth of patients that we see, the number of cases, I, you know, I think we have enough to, to train. Now, I think we also have to create a partnership with an adult facility as well in order to get the numbers. So for, I think for for adults, it's uh, uh, at least a couple hundred, 300 cases in order to be um, proficient in ERCP. For me, that that took me about two and a half years of 24-7 of, of call and waiting for the cases to come up. Um, we want fellowship to be one year. So I think we had to partner with an adult facility in town in order to make that happen too. So fellowship does it exist during the year? Because uh, they also partnered with the VA hospital. Got it. Yeah. I support it. You guys are amazing. Thank you. A couple of good questions from the chat. First one, uh, Rick Todd, do you think the increasing number of cases you're performing with each year reflects increased incidence of autoclone disease, or is it higher detection uh, rates index is sufficient in regard of retained autoclone or both? I think both, honestly. I, I think it, you can it, repeat it for them. Oh, okay. Um, so the so question is, you know, is there um, uh, a reason why we're seeing more cases in the last few years, whether it's uh, something intrinsic or we're just getting better at diagnosing it? I think both. Um, I think even in our GI clinic, we're seeing a higher uh, incidence of obesity. I'm sure you've seen that in your clinics as well. Um, unfortunately, that is a major risk factor for development of gallstones. I think, I think we're seeing a lot of that, especially in uh, some of the more rural communities um, and, the, and the reservations as well. Um, but I think you know, over the years, we've sort of uh, shown that we have this, this, this service available here at Phoenix Children's. So 
um, where we get calls from multiple EDs all across the state asking, you know, can we do this procedure? And a lot of adult GI doctors they don't want to do this. They'd rather not come in and do a, especially a smaller child. They would rather not do a patient, even 16 year olds. Sometimes they will resist doing an ERCP and they send them straight to us, which we are happy to do. Okay. Another question I have, what, is there any standard now for the timing of if you do an ERCP, you clean out the common bile duct, how long it should be before a surgeon operates and takes out the uh, gallbladder? And then the, the kind of the flip side of that is how often do you see it where you clean out the common bile duct and then there, another stump passes into it while while the patient's waiting for their left bullet? Okay, first question is about timing of of uh, the ERCP, the preoperative ERCP and a lap coli. So, so uh, typically we tell families that depending on a lot of other variables, including OR time and everything, that they can go the very next day. Um, uh, usually it's about a day or two later. Rarely do uh, surgeons uh, opt for a delayed laparoscopic colostectomy unless there's a you know, very uh, sick gallbladder or some other sort of um, um, indication. There's actually some studies showing that uh, doing an ERCP at the same time as a lap coli or, or under the same anesthetic is, is, is possible. Uh, one of the biggest fears we had initially was how much sort of um, CO2 gas we insufflate in the bowel. You know, will it cause too much distension, kind of obstruct their view of the gallbladder laparoscopically? And that's actually not the case. I've done one, one procedure um, where I did the ERCP and, and and right afterwards they went ahead and did the laparoscopic colostectomy and they had no problems with it. The challenge is coordinating that kind of procedure um, to get enough OR time and trying to do it um, during more reasonable hours of the day, I guess. Um, so that's, but that has been actually been studied as a possibility. Um, the other question is, um, um, how, often, how, often, how often does it happen that you- Another stone? Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, not, not terribly often. The risk is, you know, if we end up doing a delayed laparoscopic colostectomy, um, so we, we try and educate the families about, you know, a dietary management, which is always, you know, our goal afterwards anyway. Um, but thankfully, not very often. Um, but there have been a few cases where, where stone has slipped. Or we do our preoperative ERCP. They go for lap coli. And as they're manipulating and removing the gallbladder, one happens to spill out unintentionally. Um, and, and then we discover it later on that there was a stone spill. Either we missed it or a stone spilled during the, the lap coli. And then we go back in and scoop the duct again. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.